Welcome to Ageless by Rescue. This podcast is devoted to exploring the science of rejuvenation, uncovering the most trusted experts, the must-have products, innovations, and technology in the field of vitality, aesthetics, new beauty, and cosmetic enhancement. Well, I am so excited to introduce you to my sister from another mister, Maddie Samari. Welcome to Ageless by Rescue Podcast. Hi, Baha. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's so exciting. Now, for people who are tuning in, we've attempted this a couple of times. We've had some technical fails, but are you in for a treat today? Maddie is the original lip queen. She is also one of the beautiful faces on the Real Housewives of Sydney show that um, stole the heart and imagination of the nation. She is a beauty expert. She's a media commentator on Channel 7. She's also a friend of mine and a fellow Persian. I'm not going to say princess because I think princess is you know, not really our no, warrior, warrior. Empress, <laughs> Empress, Faradiva Empress. <laughs> um, welcome. Let's talk about the first time that you became aware that beauty could be a profession and the icons of beauty that really informed your aesthetic style. Well, you know, it's quite interesting you say that. I remember my mother always used to say when I was three, I used to always go through her makeup bag and sometimes mix up all her lipsticks together to create a new color. And my dad had a very big influence on us. He always said education is very important for women and it's very gives women freedom. And as you understand from the era that he came from Iran, it was very important for women to become educated. But also it was very interesting. He always said one area that computers will never overtake us is going to be the beauty industry. And I've always had a passion for it. And obviously, as you are the same, being Persian, we know that beauty in women is very important coming from that cultural background. And I think in our culture, for those of you who don't know, we're both Persian, we're both immigrants to Australia. We grew up in you know, households with very strong women, but also really if what a lot of people don't understand about our culture is that women are really on a pedestal. And um, in the household, uh, certainly in the households that you and I have both grown up on, our fathers adored the women in the family. And, you know, they, they were queens reigning supreme. And part of our cultural aesthetic is grooming, not just you know, DNA beauty, but how you present yourself. And, you know, I, I remember, and I, and we've had this discussion, but you don't leave the house without your hair done. You, you don't leave the all. house in a trackie. So talk to me about that in your background and, and, and what were some of those evocative moments that, you know, have, have stayed with you forever and, and made you, you know, the, the glamorous icon that you are? Oh, thank you. I think one of the biggest influences in beauty has always been my mom to me. She was she was a very beautiful woman by DNA and she was a beautiful woman in the heart. But she was one of those women that always looked after herself. She was actually one of the first women in Iran that underwent, she, they did a clinical trials on collagen and she was one of the participants for that, which is the bovine collagen that lead us today to have the hyaluronic acids that we inject in the faces. And I remember I was seven and I saw her, she was bandaged up and I said, what happened to your nose? And she didn't want to tell me that she's had a nose job, which is a very common procedure in Iran. So I always looked at my mother as someone that looked after herself. She was very well groomed with her hair. She was very well groomed with her beauty. And my auntie the same, she was one of the very pretty and very well-groomed women of Iran at the time. And I think being raised up in that environment, there is no shame for me today to be absolutely be proud of the fact that I do take care of myself. And one of the most important things I think women have to understand is today we need just want to be the best version of ourselves. So one of the things with cosmetic is we don't want to transform ourselves to someone else, but we want to keep ourselves going and obviously making ourselves the best version we can be. I, I totally agree with you. And one of the things that um, I love about you and I think has been a, a big reason for your fan base 
is that you are unapologetically yourself. And, you know, you, you own your body, you own your hair, you own your personality, you own your accent. And I think that that comes with wisdom. Was there ever any time as you were growing up in Australia or when you emigrated that you felt really yeah. different and you wished you were a blonde, blue-eyed, you know, um, Aussie girl? Well, I don't think I ever wanted to transform myself to that extent. No, never. I think every human has got their own unique personalities and unique, you know, looks about them. And as Persians say, every flower is different, but they all have got different scent, but they're all beautiful in their own way. I never wanted to, but I think with every woman, I think we were raised in a time that being very super skinny was very important. But I'm very glad for today, especially being a mother of two daughters, that that image of being that skinny has gone because that caused a lot of problem amongst a lot of women that are new growing up in our era, where it caused a lot of uh, eating disorders, mental problems. But I think with today, uh, people are being more realistic about their body shape and I love the way that women own it having curls you know it's beautiful and people are not so weight obsessed like we used to be we're actually becoming more fitness obsessed which I think it's a very good improvement and era in beauty um, and to be honest I think the Kardashians changed that for us they've really brought the good image of you know, you've got to be proud of having curves. You know, you've got to be proud of your own body. And I think I have had surgery on my body, don't get me wrong, but I like to maintain it as a feminine figure. Going back to what I touched on at the beginning of the episode with the Real Housewives series, yes. one of the things that I think that series taught the world is that this ideal of youth being the only time in your life where a woman is beautiful and desirable yes. and sexy is wrong. And I absolutely all over the world, all over yes. the world every time yeah. the Real Housewife series aired, there were no 25-year-olds. It was always no. women who were ageless and they were like living a very full life. They'd had a lot of experiences. Can you share with me your you know, any kind of insights on working on that show and and those conversations around being powerful, sexy, vital at any age? I think women are very much so like a nice bottle of red wine. We just get better with age. And I think having that age focus is is, is a very it's not the right mentality, especially for the today's world we're living. And I think one of the most amazing thing about housewives that I liked, all those women had cosmetic work and they owned it. They admit to it. Um, they were all having Botox. Um, there was only one person, which was Nicole, that didn't. So I have to share that with everyone. But I think most of the women were very proud of being in the 40s and 50s. And I think when you become older, it's your achievement that create you. It's not so much your appearance. Because I think when you're younger, you are still young, you're, you're studying, you're doing things. You haven't really, from a self perspective, you haven't really self fulfilled yourself. But I think when you become a mom and you have got your own businesses, you're successful, you've gone even through divorces, these things in women make them a lot stronger. And we start owning who we are. And there's nothing more attractive than a person that owns their life, owns their mistakes, they're, they're honest about what they've done. I think this is what makes a good woman. I think we all just, you know, focusing on someone's age and weight. Those are variable ob objects in a person. You're not going to always be 21 and you're not always going to be 49 kilos. So those are the variable things. You cannot really you know, live your life based on those because every young person will become older. But I think when I look back at my life, I have achieved so much as a woman. I have a mother of two beautiful daughters. Um, I have built up a business on my own. You know, I did the housewives. I became a beauty expert on Channel 7. I have a job that I'm passionate about and I love it and I'm good at it. So these are more achievements in my life that I look back and I go, well, I've done it. So I think these are very important things that women will have to look at more than, you know, oh, yeah, I'm young, because you're not going to be young forever. So you've got to think about during your youth, what are you doing to build up your future? But going back to housewives, did you guys like share yes. beauty secrets? Did you like, because you were the beauty expert in the group? Did the, <laughs> we did, always do. And you know, we that's what women do. do. <laughs> like, that's what women do. What did you learn from each other? And what did you teach the others? 
Well, we, we taught each other a lot. I think one of the things is you learn, when you do a reality show like that, you actually learn from one another a lot. You sometimes learn how you shouldn't be and you sometimes learn how you can be. Because I think when seven women spend so much time together, I mean, we traveled together. We were, we were locked up together for like seven days. But you, you learn a lot of good and bad characteristics because it's very easy to stand out there and view other people. And especially about beauty, we all had different appearances and we were all we were all in our late we we're all in around, in around our 40s but we we all had different skin types so it was actually quite funny i used to sit around with victoria Riz, and back then she used to work a lot with wrinkle shingle and every time on a plane i looked at her she had all these patches on her face so when she wakes up she doesn't wrinkle and that was really funny to me i love that and product. i think for I me, put it on my on, chest oh it's fantastic and and for me it was more likely on the plane, make sure I clean my makeup because we used to do a lot of stage makeup. So I used to tell the girls, make sure you always clean your makeup, use this cleanser, do this. So there were a lot of things we learned from each other. And at the same time, I think because in every woman, it's the first impression you get. You also learn some of the characteristics or looks that you just go, oh, this is a bit too much or you've got too much blush or you've got too much eyebrows. So those are the things. But at a lot of time, you don't want to offend people either. So you've got to always be careful. I think with beauty, you've got to be very careful how you point out some of the mistakes people do. And that's one of the things in women. You just don't sit around and just criticize. You just advise and come from the good place. And normally just women remember, make sure someone asks you. Don't just give your opinion. <laughs> oh my God. Again, someone. going back to being Iranian, it feels like, you know, <laughs> you're getting signs held up for you from the minute that you're born. You know, you're a six, you're a seven, you're a 10. Were you pretty growing up? I... Well, I can't really say that myself, but my mother said I was very pretty, as she would. Um, I remember I was I was very blonde. So when I was born, I was very blonde, which is not very common look in Iran. And my mom, at the age of five, took me to this photographer to do a, some portrait of me. And I remember that she said to me a week later, she drove by and all my portraits were, was in his window. And people could not believe that I was a kid. They were like, oh, she looks like a doll. But I always had long blonde hair. I was quite fair. So I didn't have a very common Persian look when I was growing up. So I think because that was different, people kind of, you know, were more drift into it. And, uh, you know, it was a more of an unusual look. So people really liked it. But my, I do believe I was a good looking kid. Well, that's uh, the reason I, I asked that question. Don't get me wrong, as I am today. <laughs> uh, well, you're good, even more gorgeous now. But that's why I asked the question, because you're so beautiful now. And oh, maybe when I speak to people, you. the ones who are more beautiful now are people who weren't necessarily as beautiful growing up. And then they learned yes. the secrets of the beauty industry. And whether it was cosmetic yes. enhancements or surgery or great skincare or great fitness regime that transformed their body type. And then they kind of come into their own in their 30s, their 40s, their 50s. So that's why I asked the question. So I you... think more likely as a baby, the most babies are very pretty. But I think one of the things you're referring to is your teenage time. Because one of the things that I learned during my teenage time, I actually suffer from really bad acne. I had a very problematic acne because I had oily skin. And at that stage, you know, a lot of people didn't use toners, which today I advise anyone that they've got acne skin and they've got acne problems is to get themselves into a really good gel cleanser, use toners, use any form of AHA. But when I was a teenager, AHA and BHA were not available. So we had very different uh, skin creams and skincare out there. But I always remember as my teenagers, yes, from the age of 12 to practically 20, and um, I always had acne. I always was one of those people that my skin always broke out to a point that at the age of 20, I even contemplated going on Rakitane. But it wasn't until I started at the age of 23 working in this industry that I learned about AHAs, using a good cleanser. And I really learned a lot about my skin and how to maintain it. And I was pretty lucky to have a job in that industry because I think today I have really looked after my skin. And I think it's very important for, especially women from the age of, because your skin it changes in every decade. So one thing people don't understand what the skin you got in your teenage is not going to be the skin you're going to have in your 20s. And one thing I realized, if you get acne and you don't treat the acne, 
ladies, something bad that's going to happen is in your 20s, you may have some acne scarring, but in your 30s, those acne scarring will turn into wrinkles and you will end up having more wrinkles than another person without acne. And simply because where you've got acne scarring is a breakdown of the skin collagen. So it's very important for the kids to not squeeze the pimples, to use really good skincare. It's very important with the teenagers to put themselves on a very good skincare regime. That's such good advice. That's really good advice. So when did you start really doing um, cosmetic enhancement? So talk to me first about your first surgeries, because normally yes. uh, I had my first nose job at 18 and then I had a revision so at 25. When did you get your first surgery? <laughs> Who hasn't? You're Persian. So one of the very common things with Persian culture is, is always a nose job. So my dad had a big bump on his nose and I inherited that from him, so my nose wasn't perfect. And obviously my mother, who, who was one of the very first people who had the nose job in Iran, she was always very encouraging. I actually, at the age of 18, was the last time I went to Iran, and I actually flew to Iran to have a nose job. I had my nose done by a doctor who was a relative of ours. He did a very nice job, but like everyone that has a nose job, and especially Persians, your nose is not perfect. Once the swelling goes down, you don't like it. So my second nose job was at the age of 23. Then um, at the age of 24, I had my lips done, but my very first lips were done by collagen, bovine collagen, because hyaluronic acids were not available. And then after that, of course, having your lips done as a young girl was a thing that I loved. I did that. I was one of the very first nurses in Australia to inject the toxin, which today is botulism toxin, which at the time, the only brand available was Botox. Today, we've got many others. But I had my Botox done because I started administrating it to the patient. So it was always very important to me to see how a procedure feels. Um, 26 or 7, I can't remember, I had my first uh, breast implant and I did that because I was working with Dr. Robert Boyle and he was he was a surgeon I was working with and I looked at all these women with great breasts so I thought I'll have that. I'd, I'd like to get my boobs done. So that was the second, that was, God, how many surgeries so far? That was the third thing I did. I have had liposuction um, and Today, very recently, the last procedure I had was with Dr. Joseph Ajaka, where I had, um, because I think one thing happened, so to, to get this story right, I was one day trying in a fitting room, and everybody knows that in a fitting room, the mirrors at the back don't lie. So as soon as I saw my butt in the mirrors at the back, I thought, wait a second, Maddie, you can't keep your face young and not your back. So as Georgia Gabor said, it's either your face or your butt. Not anymore in these days, girls, you can keep both of it young, and I have. Um, so I like to do ageless. I'm following J-Lo's rules. We're all following that uh, hymn sheet. <laughs> what about your hair and your teeth? Uh, have you done anything there? Do you wear hair extensions or is that your own hair? No, no, I use, I, it is my hair, but recently during COVID, I decided to do something fun because I was bored. So, so the, the hair you see in the Real Housewives is all mine. I have got the Persian hair, but during the COVID thing, I just got myself some little click on extension and I thought I'd do a little bit of a fun with it because I'm really, really bored. <laughs> this is from boredom, not because of having lack of hair. My teeth are mine. No, I haven't had anything with them, but I would like to get that. So as Rod Stewart said years ago, they asked him, they go, what's the difference between a woman who looks sexy, and my apologies for using this term, that a woman looking really trashy, and he goes, it's one centimeters. So what I normally say, which is in your skirt, and what I normally say to my patients, I say looking between looking enhanced cosmetically or looking overdone is that extra syringe. So I am one injector that I must say, and I'm very proud of it. I tell my clients, no, you've had too much. I do a restriction of how many meals I inject to people because sometimes you see people going, I've had six, seven, eight meals. I don't normally agree with that. I believe in cosmetic less is more. But I at the at Medispot by Maddie, what we encourage our clients is look after your skin. Because unless you you have developed your skin, you looked after it, you're using right skincare and you build the skin into the natural thickness that it needs, overfilling it sometimes can actually make the person look a lot unusual or weird. Sometimes I look at some women that have been treated and I go, it's better to have a bit of wrinkle than be looking so puffy or overly done. So I don't believe in all this liquid facelift. I don't think that's a good idea. I think if your skin has lost a lot of elasticity and it's, you've got a lot of loose skin, sometimes you can enhance it to a certain extent, but to try to lift it with fillers, it's going to create a completely deformed face. And that's something that I'm not for. Um, I'm going to uh, close this, this catch-up with you because I want to talk about lips. 
because you are yes. considered the queen of lips. And lips is a really interesting area because a lot of people forget that it actually ages. It's not just about having, yeah. a, you know, an aesthetic look of a fuller lip, but it actually ages. Can yes. you just quickly take us through what happens to lips and why we should consider getting our lips done as part of our ageless look? I think one of the main thing happens with the lips due to the process of speaking, eating, drinking. I mean, your lip is one mobile muscle on your face, if you think about it. And one of the things that people don't realize is what we refer to as smoker lines, or you want to call them um, normally smile lines. So around the lip, a lot happens. And also we have got fat pad at the corner of our mouth that I actually drop. And as your skin sags, it drops on the areas. One thing that I've always advised people is don't overdo your lips Go very subtle with it. And also with young girls, one thing that is really important, they, they never, ever put a permanent product in your lip. Because what happens is when you have permanent products, you can only do one or two revision of it. And you can never use a semi-permanent, such as other products we use around the lip area. Because what happens is if you have got a permanent lip to make your lip really full, because you're thinking, I'm 20, I want to have my lips really big. But what happens is when you hit the age 30 and 40 and you start getting those smoker lines and you start getting oral commissures, which the drooping of the skin and setting of the skin happens, we cannot never use, we cannot use semi-permanent products in those areas. And I think with lips, there's a lot to it. And a lot of time people have got uneven bites as well, which Sorry, can they create have what? that uneven, they have bites. Got uneven bites. So which comes from your teeth. So one of the arts in doing lips is to understand the muscle, to understand the aging of the lip. And what, what I always do is I always assess people's bites because if it's a dental problem, it's something I may not be able to create the lip completely even. Or if it's sometimes people have got overactive muscle on the right side to the left side of the face. So those are the things you really have to consider. You just don't inject lips. You're going to look at it. You're going to look at how your lips going to age. And more importantly, you got to get people to speak to you when you do their lips. Because a lip, you're not going to be sitting like this with a perfect lip the whole time, your lips going to move. And it's very important because normally also when we take photos ourselves or self selfies, which women do today, we all doing this. Well, in that look, it looks perfect. But what happens when a person speaks? What happens when a person eats? What happens when a person smiles? So I think when you're doing lips, you've got to consider all of those. And also remember that two areas of the skin that with women you see aging is always under the eyes, which I'm a great believer of PRP, where we take the blood, spin it, inject it. And I think on the upper lip, you can also use PRP to thicken the skin because the skin also thins out too. So those are the things to remember. And also today we're very lucky, Bahar, because we have got this dermophilus coming different viscosity. So having your lips done doesn't necessarily mean that we are making it, enhancing it or making it bigger. That's generally volumizing the lip. But sometimes what we can do, we can do lip restoration, which is for women in their 40s or 50s or older, where they have got a nice lip shapes but they really want to soften the wrinkles around it and they don't want to change the shape lip of the shape of the lip but they just want to make it a lot smoother and nicer that's that is the best advice i've ever heard on lips and i'm so pleased i asked you because it is such a tricky area yeah. final question you sure. see a lot of what's coming next from around the world the us uh, south america what are you excited about in the future of cosmetic aesthetics and enhancement? I think the PDO threads, I'm quite excited about them. I think they are going to be really nice, especially in Australia, especially for the neck area. I think it's fantastic, especially when women are getting that sagginess happens. I think one of the areas also skin tightening system is developing very rapidly for us. I mean, we use ultra format here, but there are other format that is coming out. And I think if the girls start having those treatments, sometimes in the mid thirties, they may actually have to reduce having too much fillers to get rid of the wrinkles. And one thing I always advise is always look after your neck and decolletage and your chest because these are the areas that I see a lot of women miss out of. So a lot of women go just to toxin here, toxin there, but there's no point in aging half of your face while you're maintaining and trying to make it ageless the other half, which 
we focus a lot on our frown lines around our eyes, but I think under the eyes is very important. Um, so I think the new skin typing systems are coming out are very, very going to be good. And I think people got to consider doing that more like they do the toxins because we do the toxins so we don't get the frown lines and the wrinkles. So we want to maintain our muscle that our skin is attached to. So I think one of the best things you can do is look into this new skin tightening system because they don't really thicken your skin and tighten your skin but they also tighten the ligaments that hold the skin up and the prevention is always better than cure but my advice is don't overdo it girls enjoy your youth in your 20 enjoy your youth but when you hit 30 start looking into these procedures well I loved it I loved every second of speaking to you and I'm actually going to get you back on um, the podcast because I feel like we can deep dive into a lot of the future stuff. Thank you so much for being on the episode. Thank you for having me. Loved speaking to you. I love you. See you. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, please share and rate this episode. I'd love that. 